I always begin my talk with the, uh, can everyone hear me way in the back? You can hear? Okay. Uh, with the following. If I say something and you don't, do not understand it, that's my fault. What's the next line? Anyone know? So if I say something and you don't understand it, that's my fault. What's my next sentence? If you don't ask me to clarify it, whose fault is it then? Hmm? No? It's yours. Yes? So uh, I, I'm prepared to handle questions as they occur rather than at the end. Okay? So if I go through something too quickly or you're confused, wave your hand and then we'll, we'll deal with it right then and there. I've given this talk in about 10 minutes, but we'll take a little bit slower and a little bit longer now. Okay, first point, sorry again for all the text, but these are just two points about a very well-received and long-standing belief that human threat matters a lot in human experience. Uh, that was a feature of both prior talks. And there's a very simple explanation that people perceive threat, and they act on the, that perception of threat, and that some of us, who we normally treat as those more authoritarian or conservative in some fashion or another, are more inclined to react to threat than our others. Okay, so that's the conventional wisdom. And that's reflected in the last line here that, at least in the English language, fear is actually embedded in our discussion of, of threat when we talk about fear of the other, xenophobia, Fear of homosexuals, homophobia. Fear of Muslims, Islamophobia. And what I'm going to show to you is that is fundamentally incorrect. But we need to create a new language to understand why it's incorrect. So, fundamental thesis that anger is ignored, and hence conventional wisdom is under and misspecified. And I'm going to show you that threat actually generates both anxiety and anger simultaneously. But I'm going to actually restate that another way. Because that implies that threat imposes itself on us. But I want to shift that around a little bit by saying the human brain sits in a black, dark space. It's getting information from the world and trying to make sense of that. But it doesn't do that in a passive recording way. It does it in an active way. And it wants to do that in, in, an, in an active way by asking two pertinent questions. The first pertinent question is, is a normative violation taking place? And if so, how serious is it? And the brain answers that question by signaling the answer is yes by elevating levels of anger. So the first way the human being knows that normative violations are existing in the external world is by feeling anger. And it knows that within about 40 to 60 milliseconds of the electrical signal from all the senses arriving in the human brain. But it also asks a second pertinent question. Is this unknown? Can I actually even make sense of the electrical signals that are arriving in the brain? If the answer is no, I cannot, my brain cannot, it signals that by increasing the level of anxiety or fear. It's asking those questions every moment you're awake. It's updating its answers every second that you're awake. By the way, anyone know how long it takes you to be conscious, how long it takes the brain to construct the conscious world we live in. So you see me, me raising my hand. You think you're seeing it as it happens in real time. It cannot actually do that. Because electrical signals have to arrive in the brain, they have to be processed. Anyone know what the current estimate is how long it takes the brain to, to create the subjective consciousness? 
It's 500 milliseconds. So what did I tell you about anger and fear? The brain knows whether something is unexpected in roughly 50 to 80 milliseconds. It knows that normative violations are taking place and how serious they are, also within about the same time span, under 100 milliseconds. Plus, one other point, basic neuroscience here, the human brain does not wait for us to be conscious before acting on that information. Okay, so that's just a little bit of background. So, what we're going to look at is the French responses to the terror attacks on November 13th in 2013. Here are the four hypotheses that we're going to walk. I'm not going to read them because you can read them if you have any questions about them. Uh, this is very interesting because, the, as you all know, the elections occurred just a few weeks after the attacks in Paris. So we can study what effect this had, and in particular, what effect it had on voting for the Front National in the various candidates in the various departments around, around France. Okay. Conventional wisdom, if you go back to those earlier quotes predicted, people who are fearful, seeking security, should be voting for the Front National, particularly just after one of the more intense terror attacks that have happened in France, certainly uh, post-World War II, or at, le or at least, yeah, post-World War II, okay? We're arguing the exact opposite, that people who are anxious have been told that the world is unfamiliar, and, that's, and therefore they should not be voting for the Front National. But instead, it should be those who see these attacks as violating core French norms should respond to the Front National. But the most interesting are hypotheses three and four, which the standard argument that political psychologists have been making for a long time, as both Howie and Eve have mentioned, is that we have dispositions that we normally rely on. The question is, do we always rely on them? Here we're showing two arguments that sometimes we do. That's hypothesis four. And sometimes we don't. That's hypothesis three. If you're living in a world that's all of a sudden unfamiliar, your, your inventory of past habits would be irrational to be guided by them. And so the more anxious, the less disposition should matter. If core norms which sustain your community are being attacked, then you better create heightened commitment to those core and defend your core violence. And that's what we're saying in hypothesis four. I'm actually going to show you that we're going to test that not only with the vote for the Front National in the regional elections in 2015. I'm going to show you the same, test the same hypotheses with the vote for Marine Le Pen in the, in the first round of the uh, presidential elections just a few months ago. Okay, so first, what happened? Uh, you're going to see the same slides twice. First set deals with the election in... In, uh, in December of 2015. And you can see that the, uh, the, the data, by the way, is the French election survey. I forget at what date those data become public. Uh, so you can all go back, either check these or explore other things. I think it's in a four or five months from now. I forget the exact time. But this is uh, a, a panel design that started, actually this is from the first wave uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about how we measure emotion a little bit later, and I can expand more or touch on a little bit less as we go along. But you can see heightened anxiety on the left, heightened anger on the right. So here's what happens. So the, this is logistics for those who are interested. So we plot the marginal effects as fear increases support for Le Pen, or rather for the Front National Party declines, and anger you see robustly goes the other way. So the support for the Front National candidates in 2015 goes up as a function of anger and declines as a function of anxiety. Hypotheses three on the left and four on the right. So this is far left, center right. By the way, how we talk on authoritarianism, we have the same measures of authoritarianism in these data. And if I replace these slides with authoritarianism instead of left-right, we show the same result. Okay. 
That is, anxiety on the left uh, weakens the probability among the far right to vote for Le Pen. They're less driven by their, their right commitments, and anger mobilizes them. Okay, notice the effect of mobilization is far greater on the right than it is on the left, and on the left side, they're far, they're far more compressed. Okay, so here's the first round. You're all familiar with this uh, result. Uh, and here's how we actually, we use a standard battery. We've developed this in the United States. And the first wave, we actually used a full set of 10. But for the later waves, uh, so we could gather more data, we cut down from 10 to two items per. And so you can see what those are. Uh, here's the same result now in the French uh, presidential round. You see, see the same kind of distribution, heightened fear, heightened anger. Same hypotheses now dealing with the uh, presidential election. Anxiety doesn't show quite as much of a decline, but it's a slight decline, but it's basically flat. Voting for Le Marine Le Pen is not influenced by fear, but look at the level of anger. Now, the interesting thing about the, front, the uh, 2017 election is it's re it blows up all the conventional wisdom of why people vote and how they go about it. The normal vote expects what to happen, that people will vote as they always have. But the two dominant parties in France that have essentially ruled the country, the you know, Socialists and the UMP, now the, the Republican, they're gone after this election. Socialist Party may never actually recover. It's, it's, it was that badly hindered. OK, so hypotheses three and four. Again, you get the same fundamental pattern. Uh, our, our colleague, uh, Nick Valentino, collected similar data in the United States. If we pulled out his slides, and instead of put Le Pen, put Trump, those slides would look identical to these. We have similar data from the Austrian election in 2013, exactly the same result. In a, a week, we have a study in the field right now in Germany, because we did the uh, we got funding to do that, and so we're looking, to, so in about a week or two, I'll know whether we replicated in yet, still yet another country, and we have plans for others as we're going along. So, go ahead. Um, just wondering whether the slides are about those respondents who tick only one single emotion, either anger or... No, no, absolutely not. You remember that battery? Oh, here's another big difference I should have mentioned. We asked in the 2015 election, how did you feel after the Paris attacks? And they were given 10 words. You saw six of them. And each of those they could rate from quite a lot to quite a little. So the range they had actually uh, it was an 11-point Likert scale for each of those 10 randomly presented. And here, we're no longer asking about the Paris attacks. Here we're asking about, how do you feel about France today? Using the same battery response. So we have multiple indicators. So when you, when you see anger, that's a simple summated scale of the items we ask. Now, how bitter, how resentful, how angry, how hateful do you feel about France today? And the same for the other mentions, OK? Uh, I have some supplemental slides, because we asked not only how do you feel about France, how do you feel about the economy, how do you feel about the political system, and the results essentially replicate across all those conditions. Okay. So it means what you have here is more diffuse and general anger than anger toward a specific object. Right. Uh, actually, let me, I'll just focus on this last one. We, we have to invent new words. What's really driving the right it's not fear, it's anger. And we don't even have a word for that in the English lexicon, so we invented one. Cholera. So, is that, and, and it's a weird. That's a strange word for those of you who know English. It's, it doesn't exist. Uh, we have to invent a new vocabulary. So let me just show you 
uh, a couple of things that emphasize this last point. And I'll give you one concrete example. Uh, how many of you have, uh, have read Wittgenstein? None? Well, Tractus or the Blue, or, you know, whatever. But Wittgenstein is one of the few philosophers who pays careful attention that w the words we choose are cultural inventory and assume we will take for granted we share an understanding of what they mean. And if you investigate carefully, you can reveal some things that you might be surprised at, that by invoking that word, you're involved. So I'm going to give you a, a concrete example. So forget about the rest of that. Here's the one example. It's actually more poignant now than when I pulled it out. This was, this was when David Cameron was the uh, prime minister. Uh, Theresa May, now the prime minister, was one of the members of the cabinet. Uh, Grove is another key member. And there, uh, here's, I'm going to ask you to do some work here. So you, you were having a little pissing contest between two of the cabinet ministers. And here's the article reporting it, and I pulled out just one paragraph. So those of you who have some command of English, tell me what the language rules. Now, you haven't read all of, enough of Wittgenstein to be able to do this well. But tell me what is interesting about this. Remember, the introduction was that our language about emotion is highly engendered. So tell me where you find in this paragraph evidence of emotion and gender. So let me give you some guidance. According to what you've read here, is it OK for Theresa May to be furious from what you've read. Is that an approving description of her, that she was furious? You should catch that it's evident not, because one of her spokesmen says, it would be wrong to say that Teresa is at the end of her tether. She always keeps going, it is cold fury rather than losing her temper. She can't be furious. Who is it OK to be furious? Well, what's the headline? Cameron's furious. Why is it OK for Cameron to be furious, but it's not OK for Teresa May to be furious? Because he's a man, and he's dominant, and she's supposed to be subordinate, both because of her position in the cabinet and because she's female. Right. So you have to pay very close attention to what the language rules are. And in this case, we are st our ideas about emotion are thoroughly drenched in these kinds of rules that we, we don't even notice them. That we see them, but we don't take them. And so this is one good example of that. When I talk about emotion, I'm not talking about emotion the way we do in the contemporary discourse. I'm talking about emotion that is hidden, but it's hidden not the way we conventionally think about it. So for example, what's the structure of, hum of the human psyche according to Freud? There's a superego, there's the ego, what's the third? The id. What's, what, how would you describe that structure? It's vertical. It's spatial. And the hidden lies below. And that's why you go to dream therapies and all the rest to unmask what's hidden below. What did I tell you? What's the true metaphor for where emotions lie? It's temporal. It's before. Your brain knows your emotions, creates your emotions in less than 100 milliseconds. And because it is so fast, you don't have access to it. So we make inferences about our emotions because our conscious brain does not have access to them. Okay? So someone asked earlier, do you feel anger or do you feel fear? No, you feel both of them. There are three pertinent questions the brain is asking 
every waking second. One, as I execute the various habits that I execute, my brain needs to know quickly, are they going well or am I stumbling and dropping things or whatever. The brain evaluates the executing task at hand and elevates or diminishes the level of what we call enthusiasm as a function of that dynamic and that answer. At the same time, it needs to know other things. Like, is this environment risky or not? And it evaluates that by addressing the level of anxiety we feel. And are we being attacked by a familiar foe or not? And it, it does that by a level of, of anxiety. So someone mentioned earlier, uh, and how it'd be a nice foil for me to, to challenge him on. We have the word ambivalence. What does technically the word ambivalence mean? That there are two oppositely valenced responses to the same object at the same time. What have I just told you? At every single moment, your brain is dealing with three pertinent questions. Here's another question. Does the term negative politics or negativity or negative bias make any sense given what I've told you? And the way I've told you should signal the answer I'm expecting you to give if you follow it carefully. No. Okay. Negativity is a conflated concept. We don't like failure. We feel depressed. We don't like the unfamiliar because we don't know what to do. That's heightened level of anxiety. We don't like confronting someone who's challenging our core beliefs or commitments or values. That's anger. Well, what's negativity? It's all of those things. But as I've just shown you, they produce different functions when you plot them independently. So science, there's a fundamental rule of a scientific concept. It must, must measure one property and only one property. But our, the human language always uses terms that have multivalent meanings. So if I ask you, let's have a discussion about justice, we could talk about justice for a day, a month, a year. At the end of the day, we're not going to have a single property that says, this is a high level of justice, this is a low level of justice. We understand exactly what it is. So I'm not arguing that scientific language is the only language. We can't survive on scientific language because it's too impoverished. But it can identify things that we don't otherwise know. OK, so let me see. Was there anything else I wanted to uh, mention? Nope, I think that's it. I've got some other slides, but uh, oh, this is my favorite slide because it's one other point I, I like to make in my talks. So I mentioned the senses. There, uh, of the senses, all but one are electrical signals arriving in the brain. Anyone know what the sense is? There's, a, there's one sense where the brain actually touches the external world and based on that touch, interprets it. Every other sense is mediated. So light strikes the back of the retina, excites cells, cells send those send electrical signals down the optic nerves. What's the sense where the brain actually touches the world? What? The skin. The skin. No, that's electrical. No? Smell. Part of your brain extends into the sinus cavity. It's called the olfactory bulb. Molecules touch the olfactory bulb, and based on the molecular structure, we, we get a sense of smell that's a reflection of that object. By the way, that discovery has transformed the perfume industry, because now they understand a bit more about how the brain actually distinguishes between different smells. What is this, what, what's the importance of this? What's the one thing the brain does not know? The future. And actually, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, he makes a major point of that. The one thing, we have to live in the future, but we don't actually know it. We don't see it. We're making judgments. So let me show you one more slide. We have two ways of doing that. We can act as peasants, or we can act as bankers. And all of us have the capacity to do both. And anxiety switches us from here, which is where we are most of the time, to occasionally here. 
All of us can exist in one of two mental states, what the psychologist at NYU, John Barge, called automaticity. We just know how to go and do and manage things. That's the left column. And, but as bankers, bankers had to make decisions about the future. I, I need to open a new store, give me a loan. The banker's making a bet on the future. Peasants are betting on the past. And that's what we do most of the time. Okay, so I've gone on probably 24 minutes by my clock. I was supposed to go 30, but I wanted to have lots of time for questions. And I want Eve to see the whole schmear, and okay. you can. Okay, so questions. So, go ahead. Yes, maybe a little question because I discussed Just about go. your paper. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. With your cohort, Martial and uh, Pablos. Yeah. Because I already know this paper. But, <clears throat> um, just the point is, I'm not convinced that the real causality between anger and uh, both. Right. Because, of course, if, for example, I hate Muslim, I will vote for Front National, but also I will be anger after terrorist attacks. So, for me, it's unclear. I, I understand that people who vote Front National are more angry, but the causality is not clear. Okay, but remember what I'm, we're showing here. So, uh, actually, it's this slide here that's the more telling. So, uh, here, the colors are, the colors, yeah. So, the colors are, well, let me turn this. So, the colors are not quite so clear, but essentially, the far right is the top line. Far left is the bottom line. And then, intermediate is center right, center left. What you're seeing is that if anger was spurious, so that's another way of restating the question, right? Is anger just a projection of people's dispositions? So of course, Front National voters will hate Muslims. Right? If that was the case, then, uh, no, this does actually work. I just have to remember to turn it on. Okay, this line, if that was true, that line should be flat, not sloped. So among the orange are the people on the far right. And those on the far right who are not angry are much less likely to support Le Pen than people on the far right who are very angry. And that was the same thing in 2015, same thing on the Trump voters. That is, you're, we're getting some added understanding. Not all Front National people responded with anger about France today. But the ones who did were far more likely to support Le Pen. Far more likely to support Le Pen, sorry. So that's, that's the key difference, right? And that there's a distinction between, there's a distinction so that this is going down, saying that the effects of, of anger and fear are neither identical, in fact, contrary. So in effect, what this is telling you is that each of our brains is wrestling with which is the more important, that this is unusual or this is a familiar challenge to my core beliefs. And at, at any given moment, whichever our brains decide is the more important, our brains are in effect saying, I don't make a linear decision. I let parallel assessments fight it out among themselves. And if anger is the dominant, for me, it's driving me toward Le Pen. If anger is the dominant, it drives me the other way. Okay? Does that, does that I want to make sure we're communicating or not. Maybe. 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 Okay. <laughs> Follow up quickly because I'm looking at the slide. It looks like that you do get this interesting difference between anxiety on the left, or fear on the left, right. and anger on the right slide. 
Only for those on the far right, right. party. Yep. Otherwise, they look familiar. And what does that tell us? That seems to be significant. And so maybe there's yeah. something that you can say that would... Uh, so, did I have, oh, I, I didn't put that one in. I, I'm, so, uh, so if we replace left, right with uh, authoritarianism, you get the same basic pattern. Now, authoritarianism, what we find here, and I think essentially it's another way of interpreting what Howie said earlier. Authoritarianism as a disposition matters to authoritarianism. It doesn't matter for people who are non-authoritarian, who are at the low end of the scale. Right? So the politicized dispositions are not universally influential across the range. So the fact that I reject authoritarian values, if I'm given a questionnaire, means if there's an authoritarian candidate, I don't, I don't care. That's not a candidate that I'd ever consider supporting. So whether I'm angry or anxiety has less of an effect. So if we go back here, <coughs> So over here, I mean, these are people for whether they're angry or not or fearful or not. That's not adding any information to them because people on the left, the, these top two rows here, weren't considering voting for Le Pen anyway. So the relevance of being angry about France today is not, or anxious about France today, is not going to be influential when they're considering voting for Le Pen. We have the same diagrams, by the way, for Macron, Mélenchon, and uh, Fillon. And there you find remarkably good distinctions, which, depending on which disposition you're talking about. So the interesting, uh, too bad I didn't, I've got, we've got another paper. Uh, the interesting contrast would be, here's a far right candidate. The mobilizing effect of anger on this diagram here works the same way for Mélenchon, but here it's for those on the far left. So anger is mobilizing for anyone who feels it as long as it's a pertinent response. So the French who are angry about France and were left identifiers, they voted preponderantly for Mélenchon in the first round. That's the first point. Go ahead. You want to use this one? Thank you very much, George. I, mean, I just want to, I mean, what we do see here, these are rather, well, the coefficient effects and, well, it's the... Right. It's not the, it's not the level of anger or the level of fear. It's the coefficients as they increase with the... Well, and, and I want, I mean, what yeah. I saw in one of your um, political psychology articles that we have, I have studied recently is that the level of anger amongst far-right voters is already much higher than the level of anger of the, well, the leftist ones. And the same goes with fear. Even with fear, the level of fear amongst far-right voters is much higher. So I just wonder whether fear is not effective for the far-rights anymore because they are already pretty fearful no matter what. And um, whether it's not rather the level of anger which really produces the, um, the affiliation to vote for the far right more than just anger as such. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so to restate, actually, uh, we're going to have to develop, as I mentioned earlier, a new vocabulary. Because in one of the papers, it was actually those on the, so if you think about the Charlie Hebdo attacks, so we, we have not quite as good data, uh, but that's in a political psychology article. It was people on the left who were fearful who moved to endorsing authoritarian policies. Okay. So the main thing I try to emphasize is that fear is less interesting as a substantive influence as it is is a triggering effect to state whether I'm going to rely on my dispositions or look out in the world and look at alternatives. Right? So 
on that first slide here, that fear here has flat, doesn't mean fear is unimportant. It means that the fact that I'm fearful about France doesn't produce a specific, it doesn't tell me which candidate to vote for. What it tells me is I want to listen to what they have to vote for, as opposed to, I don't need to listen to the candidates, I already know who I'm going to vote for. So fear plays a special role, whereas anger has a binding and social collective function, it plays a different kind of role. Uh, and that tells you who to vote for. Yeah, but what I wanted to say is that when you look at the level of fear and anger and you compare between leftists and rightists before or after the attacks, what I understood is that these specific levels are lower amongst leftists compared no. to the rightists. It uh, uh, may increase before and after the attack, but the absolute levels are still lower among the left-leaning ones than among the right-leaning ones. And that's what I thought, that maybe this is something... I don't think that's... I don't, I'd have to look at the data again more carefully, but I don't think that's true. So these... So, so this plot... So essentially the question is, is if we divided these two distributions between those on the left and the right, could you distinguish them because those on the left tend to populate lower levels they would, the left is over here, and the right is over here. That's the hypothesis you're suggesting, right? That the right is more prone to, ang to anger and more prone to anxiety. No, I was talking about the absolute levels of anger and well, that's, that you have been measuring. Well, that's, that, that's what these scales are measuring. This is, the, this is the univariate distribution of fear in the population, of our of the French election study and anger, as in this case, how they felt about France today. <coughs> okay, we are going well. Yeah, what Sonia suggested is that there could be something like a ceiling effect for anger among rightists. Uh, I don't. Th well, first we don't get ceiling effects because here we've truncated it at point six, and the scale goes to point one. So we're not finding that. And, and with US data, we've never found ceiling effects, even with 9 11, because we have the same data about 9 11. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, the measurement question how did you measure uh, emotion? Is, is okay, so uh, I mentioned it too quickly, but so at, we always give people an object. They, we could read the, here, read this story, newspaper story. or concentrate on the 9-11 attacks in the United States or the Paris attacks. How did you feel? And then we give them a battery of, in this case, this is uh, after the uh, Paris attacks, these six words in randomized order. And after each word, they are shown a scale from not at all to quite a lot. And there are 10 divisional points in between. Uh, in the United States, we couldn't do it in this survey. We sometimes just give them a slider and just say, move that slider up or down. Uh, we have an article coming out in, what's the name of the journal? Political Science Research and Methods. So you can go online and get a copy from them. And so the, people just move a slider up or down, which gives you true continuous data for each one. And then we, uh, after we collect the data, we check in the usual confirmatory factor analysis way to do these items load the way we expect them to load and can they be combined? Then we could take, in this case, each of those pairs, we just take those scores, combine them into simple summated scales, and then rescale them so they range from zero to one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, maybe one second question about the mix of emotion, as you said, right. because we can have an ambivalent emotion or something on both at the same right. time, one negative and one positive or two negative. Right. Um, what do you think about, um, I don't know if you tested or you studied in your research, if you test and you contrast hope, emotion, and sentiment, right. uh, and uh, fear, fear, well, right. maybe there is a kind of uh, mix it between, you know, mix right. emotion and positive emotion. Okay. And I'm, I'm just wondering about this, this idea of right. emotion. Okay, so a little bit of background. In the English language, there are 
over 700 emotion words. So one of the first tasks is to figure out which of those words indicate something different or are just synonyms. Okay. So that's the background. So the question is, well, what about, I'm going to abbreviate it, but where would hope lie? But notice we have hope here. Right? We've used a number of words to measure enthusiasm, and we cannot distinguish based on the responses people give between hope, enthusiasm, joy, elation, or the, the, the lower end of the range, depression, you know, and the like. Right, but these, thi but the, what the conf what the analysis of these data reveal is that people, if you ask the right questions and use the right measures, they can tell you how much of each of those they're feeling at that moment. But if I asked you straight up, if we met on the street and I said, you know, I know your brain can, is feeling multiple things. How enthusiastic are you at this moment? And uh, at the same time, I want you to tell me how angry you are and how fearful you are. We're not equipped to do that for a whole variety of reasons. Part of it is the nature of our brains and how they work. Yeah. So another way of putting it, the brain pre-consciously, that is in those before 500 milliseconds have gone by, is massively parallel processing. Does everybody know what parallel processing means? Anyone who doesn't? know what parallel processing means. Good. Because if, if you all did, we can stop. OK. When the electrical signal, I'll give one concrete example. When the electrical signals come down the optic nerve and go into the brain, the brain splits that signal and sends it to different parts of the region of the brain, each of which is devoted to a specific task. So one part of the, uh, of the cortex is devoted to saying, is there color? If so, which one? At the same time, that part of that same electrical signal goes to another part of the brain and says, there are objects. What are they? Like, for example, if you think of your brain getting electrical signals from millions of cells in the retina, which of those cells belong to, are identifying an object that belongs to the one next to it? So how do you know that this is an object? Well, there's a part of the brain that is devoted to answering just that question. And actually, there's another part of the brain where that at the same time, it's saying, is that moving? And by the way, the analysis of whether it's moving towards you or away from you is, is determined before whether the object is moving side to side. Anyone guess why? Because if I threw this at you, you'd want to be able to duck early and the brain gives priority to that answer before it gets the other one. So that's just three. There are actually more things the brain wants to know about perspective, depth, perception, all the rest. All those things are being done separately and then integrated in the back of your brain, and then you get conscious vision. That's why conscious vision takes about a half a second to create, because all these separate analyses have to be then integrated. Most of you have your laptops open. You may be reading some emails or uh, what are the news or what have you. Same thing is true about reading. The impression of words goes into your brain, goes to do different regions of the brain, and actually it's a French neuroscientist who uh, discovered this. His name is Dehain. One part of the brain is trying to figure out what do these letters combine into form words. At the same time, another part of the brain is saying, what does this mean? And those then converge. What I'm telling you is about the way emotions work is that the three dominant emotions we're looking at are each asking a pertinent question that they're designed to answer and to do that in parallel. And that creates a contestation into which takes over. So for example, as I mentioned, if I threw something and you had to duck, your brain figures out, oh, I better stop paying attention to anything else. I don't care what the rest of my brain is doing. This part of the brain is telling me something's coming at my head and I better back. And by the way, your brain does that with real accuracy. How do we know that? If I, throw, if I throw an object at you, which way will you duck? You will duck opposite the direction it's coming at you. Well, did you decide that? Uh, 
maybe we can end on this last experiment because this is all stuff that tends to blow people's mind. So let me give you an experiment of your hidden brain. Your brain, by the way, lies to you all the time. So this is an experiment you can do to show you that it's lying to you. I want you to touch your nose with a finger. I don't care which finger, touch your nose. Okay? How many touches did you feel? How many touches? That's not what your brain recorded. It's impossible for your brain to touch, to experience that one touch. How does the brain know, how does the brain know that something touched the nose? Well, we've already talked about it. Someone said, there's electrical signals, right? Okay, so where's it getting electrical signals from? But which skin? I mean, you, you, we're covered with lots of skin. Skin on the nose, so it's an electrical signal to the brain. Tip of your finger. Electrical signals on touch travel at about 78 feet per second. So what do you know now? How long is it to go from your nose to the brain? How long does it take to go from your fingertip to your brain? Can those two signals arrive at the same brain at the same time? It's impossible. I mean, it's basic physics, right? If it takes so many seconds per meter, the signal from your nose gets there first, then the signal from your finger gets there second. But you all said, I felt one touch. So your brain lied to you, right? Why does the brain do that? Because consciousness is not for accurately understanding the world. That's not what it's designed for. Right? So the brain doesn't want to confuse consciousness. So it says, oh, I know what that is. That's because my brain, uh, I just received a signal from the finger. That's delayed. That's later. So I'm not going to confuse you. I'll merge them. So your brain is making active decisions about your mind that you have no access to. Okay. Okay. Right. Now, I can ask myself how uh, verbal measure, psychometric and question right. are uh, reliable right. to measure this kind of okay. thing. Okay, oh, I misunderstood. So the question is, how many ways could we go about measuring emotion in addition to yeah, maybe. this? Yeah. Okay, so there are at least a number. I'll, I'll go through them all, and they all have strengths and liabilities. Uh, one active way of people thought they could do it was get some psychophysiological measure heart rate or galvanic skin response. Turns out they, none of those discriminate. They can, because what all those measures tell you is essentially the brain has become actively engaged in preparing us from activity. But all the three things do that, right? Enthusiasm does that, so does anger. Okay, so the psychophysiological route, you know, uh, Pulse rate, heart rate, or pulse rate, uh, none of those work because they don't discriminate. One promising, and I've done some work with that, as have many others, is called facial EMG. Okay, so this is the corrugator muscle, it's the frown, and that's usually taken as a measure of anxiety. Uh, the zygomatic is here, that's the smile muscle. So you can put little electrodes. The, tr the limitation of that is it's a small case. It's very difficult to do that accurately. No. You, uh, just a background so those of you can know. You have to have a, an electronically isolated room <laughs> because the, mic the, 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 you know, the little uh, magnets that pick up the skin, if there's electrical stimulation in the environment that's uncontrolled, it creates a lot of noise. So you have to electrically ground the room to exclude that. Uh, you can also do fMRIs plausibly, but not really greatly, because anxiety is an inhibition system. It shuts down certain parts of the brain as it activates. And a full model, which fMRI is bad at doing, 
it's telling you, yes, this is lighting up, but it's not telling you what's lighting down. So uh, in this case, even though we, we yearn for something that would be, seem like better science, this actually works better than any of those, which is why we use it. Okay. So uh, there's a literature on that, and if you want to get in touch with me, I can send you, I can send you those. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, uh, Fred and Sonia both have my email, uh, and you can certainly follow up if you, if you wish to see more of this stuff or have questions about it. Did you have a question? No, OK. Right. Um, you don't talk about people from the very center of the political spectrum. Right. People for, who identify themselves as a okay, right. and, and you talk only, in fact, about in the extremes. people engage right. in politics. And they're engaged because they identify on the right. politics uh, right. scale. And the second question is about, it's more about the interaction effect of emotions and personality traits. Right. Because we, we, we began this presentation by uh, right. the big five, and what can you talk us about that? OK. So let me flip them around, because it's easier. Uh, actually, not, in, not so much in these data, but in the US data. I've looked at the big five. Uh, I think for politics, they're a very modest value. They may get you 5% explain variants, but they're, they're really fairly trivial. Uh, you should know that the big five have two fundamental limitations. The researchers who created those scales did so with the obligation as a matter of psychometric properties that all the scales had to be orthogonal to each other. Why, that may be useful for statistical purposes, but it makes no sense because that's not how the brain works. The brain is not designed with orthogonality in mind. So that's one strangeness. Second, do you know how they validated the big five? They uh, went to hospitals uh, and interviewed all the people who came to visit people who were in the actually mental institution. Actually, this is the Minnesota one, but the same thing applies. So they use the normals against the abnormals, and that makes no sense. Second, th the meaning of them, and this is something Howie was getting at with respect to authoritarianism, is thoroughly polluted by conventional wisdom that's unjustified. So the first version of the big three had one of the big three called neuroticism. Okay? But in this slide that was put up earlier about the big five, I think that was Eve's presentation, called it what? Emotional stability. They, they flipped the side to the other end, right? But it's not emotional stability at all. It, uh, it is essentially, you're talking about fear, anxiety, sensitivity. So it has a far more limited, but if you remember that slide that Eve showed, there were all these facets and sub-facets and all the rest of it, and I, I'm willing to bet quite a lot that if you actually looked at the validation of those distinctions, you'd be horrified. So that's the second question. And then the first question, since I've since forgotten it. OK, the middle. Actually, uh, if we uh, here, obviously, the focus was on who voted for the Front National. Uh, in a paper we're working on now, we're looking at, OK, so who voted for Macron? Who voted for Mélenchon? Who voted for uh, Fillon and Le Pen? Look at all four of them. And then we look at the full range, center, middle, and left. And actually, this will tell you why Macron won. Uh, if I showed you this slide, which I don't have on my iPad, unfortunately, but I can describe it. How did you feel about France today? There's one slide that tells you exactly how Macron won. If we asked how enthusiastic you are about France, Macron is the only one with there's a huge gap between those who feel enthusiastic and those who don't. 
and it spans almost the entire ideological spectrum. It begins in the far left with a modest range, same modest range in the far right, but everywhere else it, it's like this huge space between the most hang. So what Macron was able to do was saying, we have a great future and here's what it's like and this evaluation suggested that he reached the French public largely in the center by mobilizing them behind his cause. So now, Obama, which is yesterday, Obama no, that's slightly different because it's a more complicated situation because of race and, and the like. So it wasn't quite so uniform across the entire. Let me ask one moment. I think the French election turned on one event. And I'd be curious as to what you thought of what the one event you would pick on. When does Macron all of a sudden look like he is getting to the French people? And I, I think the event was when he went to Lille and Le Pen set up this situation at the factory where the workers were prepared to shout him down. And he stayed and talked to them for what, two hours? And they weren't persuaded, but what did that tell the, the French population about Macron? that he was in an unobtrusive way, in an inoffensive way, willing to listen, willing to talk, and willing to give dignity to people who, whether they agree with him or not. And I think that moment persuaded them. That's why the center rallied to him, as they did. So it's very much a center against the extreme election. It's a very interesting election because the two expected dominant parties that have controlled French politics disappeared, and the conventional wisdom in French and American political science is that can't happen. It shouldn't happen, but it did. So we need some other explanation. We're trying to offer one. It looks like you had a question. Yeah, it was kind of the same question, but a totally different than, than the one about personality, because uh, I wonder if the affective intelligence theory can tell us something about inter-individual uh, differences, because uh, apparently some people uh, feel angry or they feel threatened or, or both and it is not because of the social situation, it's not because of the terrorist attack that generates different emotions and so you said personality wasn't a, a key variable but uh, well, I mean there is something to do with personality if it's not the big five maybe it has to do with the children very value yeah. or another kind of but so let me just, you, right so let me distinct, I think there are politicized dispositions, of which authoritarianism is one, left-right identification is another. There are various versions of what's called a sexism scale, that's still yet another. Uh, dispositions that have become politicized are consequential. The big five was developed by psychologists who had no interest in politics. And so there, I'm not sure why one would expect them to have much political significance, and by and large, they, they don't. Even their proponents say, depending on who you listen to, you can ignore most of the big five, but I think there's something over here. But that something over, like conscientiousness is supposedly related to conservatism, right? But it's a very weak relationship. You know, it isn't worth much paying attention to, I, I think. Put it this way, uh, I, wouldn't think, I wouldn't spend any of my time devoted to it if it was up to me. If I was a young student who wanted to create a research agenda, <laughs> that's not where I would go. Thank you very much. Just on your, your latest remarks regarding right. the turning point about the latest elections, uh, what I had in mind was the uh, television debate. Right. It was of course you are right, because the fact right. that you visit it was quite uh, obvious in television, right. but on the debate it was obvious that, that there was a difference between uh, the stand on uh, right. uh, someone who can be elected as a, uh, the head of the government and uh, another person who Do you, you mean the debate between, is the, you mean the debate between uh, and, the, and Macron? Well, as I understand it, the poll swung three percentage points against her and in favor of Macron within days after that event. It's, there was a long-standing uh, consequences. And if you look at the Le Pen's party now, which right. is very really difficult. I'm not a specialist, but from... Uh, no, 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 that's right. I mean, uh, 
as I remember, he was leading about 61, 62 to low 30, uh, 34, 35, somewhere in that range, if my memory is correct. And then after the debate, she, her support collapsed by 3%, and it, that 3% went to Macron. Uh, and basically, that what we would expect is those who were anxious, who, who were considering voting her, got anxious. And actually, I, we didn't, I don't think we had any data right after the, I don't think one of the, we didn't control when the waves were going into the field. So we're kind of stuck on that. So we have this rich data, because we knew about the, the first round, so we wanted to get that. But I, I'm pretty sure we don't have that. But actually, that's a great question, because the next thing I'm going to do is email Marshall and, and Pavlos and say, do we have that or not? You know, so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, which are very important, which are key to me. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, you argue that anxious citizens are more uh, in line with the ideal of a fully informed citizen. And OE makes more or less the same statement with the ambivalent partisans, which more comply with the ideal of a fully informed okay. citizen. So I would very much like the two of you to exchange okay. whether you are theorists. Okay, let me put it. Look alike in a way. Okay, let me. Yeah. So let me put up this one slide that I raced through a little bit. So this slide here. Our brains have evolved to do both because each represents a certain strength, but at the same time a certain weakness. If I'm a peasant all the time, I guarantee I will go extinct when something about the world changes so that my inventory of habits will not work. If I'm a banker all the time, I'm guessing that my, cal my thoughtful calculations will always produce a better result. And as the financial crisis of 2006 and 2008 ought to tell you, Bankers screw up. Okay. So our brain said, well, I, can't, I don't know which of these approaches to take except by one signal. And that signal is whether the situation is familiar, in which case being a peasant <coughs> makes sense, or whether it's unfamiliar, in which case shifting over to be a banker. Now, that's preparation for a more direct answer to Fred. Our normative understanding of democracy is far too singular. In, and we actually recognize that if we talk about causes we believe in. So among my causes, civil rights, uh, anti-sexism, and all the left, I have no doubts about those. But where does that fit? If you ask most democratic theorists, like Fishkin, like Habermas, if we could talk to him, John Rawls, and others, uh, Selma Ben Habib and others, if you said, wait a minute, you say deliberation is good. Let's sit around and talk about why shouldn't we get rid of uh, you know, people who don't think like us? And they'll get very defensive and they start talking a lot like peasants because they have core beliefs too. So democracy properly understood says none of us knows whether the world is familiar or not. So even if my brain is telling me act like a peasant, I may be wrong. Even if my brain is telling me I should act as a banker, my brain may be wrong. That's why we have both available. And we hope we can make the right choice. Remember that picture of the canceling of the psych fair? Right? Neither of these is perfect. If they were, evolution would have concentrated us into one mental state. We all have one spine. We all have two eyes. We all have two lungs. Why? Because evolution has ascended on those as an optimal strategy for dealing with life. That's what our species is. 
but we vary in height. We may, but I, I'm pretty sure we're going to have two eyes, one spine, and two lungs. But as our food supplies have gotten better, I mean, look at the, the description of the Japanese people from right after World War II to 20 years later. They got taller, they got heavier. They still had two eyes, they still had one spine. What this is telling us is our brain have never, evolution has never figured out what's the right way to go. And the reason why is because the world is in many respects unknowable and we have two ways of addressing that. Okay. So, it's, so we need a democratic theory that, that privileges solidarity on some occasions and privileges deliberative autonomy and recognizes the wisdom that each contains but recognizes the fallibility that each contains. And we don't have that, because political theorists are very single focused. They have one answer, only one answer, and that's the answer they give. Either we should all be like this, and so the conservatives, so if you read uh, Joseph de Mestre, that's what he's describing. If you read Immanuel Kant, that's what he's describing. And what I'm saying is they're both right. But neither of them knows when they're right. But our brains make the best guess we can at any given moment. The other thing is, just as you didn't know why your brain told you there was one touch, our brains do lots of things for us, where the us is the conscious mind, and we don't have introspective access to it. And we need a democratic theory that, uh, that is based on those insights, as best we can understand. So that's my complicated answer to a, an important central question. Howie? I will say uh, that uh, George and I have debated this a long time. <laughs> for a long time. And, and we start off, actually, I think before George's book came out in 2000, so this is that long ago, I think I asked him a question at a conference and said, there are many potential switching mechanisms. Why just anxiety? So it goes back to the question that I asked him let's call it 20 years ago. Um, what I like about, let me start off with what I like about what you have said, and that is, I like this sort of uh, aesthetically, the idea that um, the brain is prepared for a couple of different modes. Um, it's prepared for, to, um, to move towards social solidarity, and it's moved uh, toward trying to envision in a more deliberative way social progress. And I really think that that is kind of at the heart of uh, what is optimal in our politics. So we need some people to defend the social order. We need authoritarians. So our dual nature can be, you know, there, there is a, we can analogize that to the optimal um, kind of contradictory forces or force that we have in society as a whole. We need to maintain the order but we also need to progress and change and improve. And I guess at the individual level, the brain uh, automatically signals to us when one strategy is called for. Uh, and I like that. I, I have no qualm with that. I think that it must be something on the order of that. And I think, and I agree as well that um, our, any complete dem a theory of democracy needs to acknowledge the baser aspects of um, you know the adapted mind, and, and by that I mean the ones that yield social solidarity, because by increasing social solidarity, you are also creating outgroups who are outside of the circle of human sympathy. And so, on. and so that looks very ugly, but there are times in which that is probably what people's instincts are telling them is required. And so I think that's a deep fundamental part of our nature. And for democratic theorists to shake that off or ignore that, I think, is uh, fundamentally wrong. But, okay, so that's all one side. And then to the other side is the question of, and this is what we raise in our book, The End of the Partisan, is when will people think in ways that are, one, um, 
uh, deep. That is, when will they rely on information that is harder to get at, but is better? All right, so we're always making a trade-off between accuracy and efficiency, and most of the time, we're willing to make some mistakes because we can make decisions quickly. We don't need perfection. So we sacrifice accuracy because thinking is hard. It, it literally depletes us. And in addition to thinking deeply versus less deeply or in a more shallow way, is the question of when are we willing to think even-handedly uh, versus uh, thinking in a way that privileges what we already believe and in which we seek out evidence uh, to um, validate what we already believe to be true. And if we think that sometimes thinking deeply and even-handedly is normatively good, and you know, it sounds to a political theorist, they would always say, always do that. Right? We know that's not, we know that's one, inefficient, and two, unrealistic, and three, probably not even always helpful. So the question is, when are those things good? And admittedly, my response is one that is embedded strongly in the American political context, because I'm not trying to answer this question in any broad philosophical way or any way that accords with you know, um, you know, the, the, the adaptive <coughs> mind. I'm trying to you know, advance a theory that accords with the um, nature of American politics in 2012, or whenever the book came out. And my sense then was that um, we are able to derive sufficient confidence in our judgments about politics by simply towing the party line, by being zombies. The party says something and you just take it on faith. Because how do you know? <laughs> right? You might as well delegate your judgment. And we were doing that not only because we think we're insufficiently capable of answering the question, but we also derive psychological benefit from expressing loyalty and social solidarity. That always feels good. And our one simple, simplistic thought was that sometimes because of um, the behavior of the parties, um, you can't derive sufficient confidence by simply thinking along party lines, or that you don't derive psychological benefits from being loyal. So when are those motivations interrupted? So we argue they're interrupted largely when the party fucks up. I thought I would say that because maybe you're getting tired. And, and, and so when the party performs poorly, I want to give you an example of the second administration of George W. Bush. Okay? First he gets elected and he wants to privatize Social Security, meaning he wants to, in a sense, get rid of the most popular public policy in the country. Everybody says no. Then there's a major hurricane. He's off on vacation, and they tell him, get back, go to the hurricane. You've got to say something. He's like, I'm on vacation. So he gets bad grades for that. And then there are about seven or eight sex scandals. Do you have those here? It might not matter here. In America, you don't have sex under almost any circumstance. It's considered just bad. Okay? So there were lots of those. And then... In 2008, the president goes on television and says, look, um, we're out of money. I need a trillion dollars, like, right now from the American people. All those things collectively added up to... What about the Iraq war? Oh, thank you. It's in the book. I know, I read it. The public loses <laughs> confidence in a major war. All of these things added up to Republican identifiers thinking, I do not think my party is performing well. And so to us, what's relevant is that I identify with the party, but right now I can't trust it. And so you can't simply follow the party line. You're sort of... You cannot imagine how works this works with the socialist party, for instance. Does it work well? Yeah, no, it works very well with the socialist party. Let's spend more time here. <laughs> and so it is precisely under that condition, and that's what we refer to as partisan, 
ambivalence. It's not I like and I dislike something simultaneously. It's that I am X, and yet my view of X is negative. It's under that precise circumstance that thinking more deeply and more even-handedly is required and is helpful and leads to better outcomes. And that might be tantamount to anxiety. And George has argued that, and we pu I published a paper in 2015 saying, uh-uh. So I don't know. I, I'm really not strongly committed to, you know, to, any, to any singular position along the axis. We tried to work together with a, a third group of people um, from Stony Brook, and you know, we, we either didn't have the energy, but it was George's, at George's behest. He thought, look, we're all working along similar lines, we should try and figure out where we all fit in. And I think we should still do that. I think we had other commitments at the time. I'll shut up. If I could add one thing, because it's, it's kind of useful, because it's, it's a common wisdom. Which do you think is more accurate, the pre-conscious brain or the conscious brain? It's a very, if, if you know any fundamental neuroscience, it's the pre-conscious brain. Is system one? Hmm? System one? System one is system far one. more accurate. And system two, or the world we inhabit right now, is far less precise, far less able to control what we do. So here's my favorite study. You can find it in one of my, in, in, the, in the neuroscience book. It's by a group of Italian uh, neuroscientists. It's a, I love clever studies. So it's based on an illusion. So if, 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 if I don't have that slide with me, but if we had uh, two identical circles, we would all see them as identical circles. So there's an illusion called the Titchener illusion. That is, if you put around one of those circles, very small circles, but around the second circle, very large circles, consciously you will see the first one as bigger and the second one as smaller. So you just saw the two circles identical, then I throw up a slide imposing those external stimuli around them and all of a sudden you see and people can notice that. So here's what the clever design was. They made wooden chips to fit on those circles. And they asked people to reach out and pick up the wooden chip that covered the circle. With the illusion showing, right? So what would you expect them to do? So one circle looks large and the other looks small. What would you expect the hand to do? As you reach out, most of you have a cup. What does your hand do when you reach out to pick up a bottle? How? Why did the hand, does the hand work? Your brain figures out exactly how wide, right? With a little bit of extra, but not much. Right? It's remarkably accurate, okay? So if you're, and the th by the way, have any, any of you given a command to your hand, open up 3.26 centimeters so that you can cat pick up this cup, which is 3.1 centimeters wide? That's not what, that's our pre-conscious brain. That's not our conscious brain. So what they did was they varied the strength of the illusion. Anyone know how you would vary the strength of that illusion? Well, you make the surrounding circles either very much bigger, only modestly bigger on the one hand, or small or really small, and you can make the illusion more or less powerful. So they then it did two things. They put a, electric uh, diodes on the fingers <coughs> with light so they could measure. As someone reached out to pick up this bag or pick up this plug, they would measure exactly how far apart the fingers were. Now, if the illusion was powerful, what should happen? This is smaller, this is larger. If as I reach out to pick this up, my fingers are going to be less far apart than here, right? Uh, you ought to guess what the finding was from what I've said. So they show people the chip where the illusion makes that circle look larger versus the chip that the circles make it look smaller. If the pre-conscious brain was really accurate, what should happen? 
the fingers should not open up any wider based on the visual illusion. And that's exactly what they showed. At the same time, they asked people which, was, which circle was bigger, which ship is bigger. And people's subconscious report was, oh, the one with the big, with the big circles is smaller, and the one with the small circles is bigger. So subjectively, they gave an incorrect answer, but the fingers in the brain that directed those fingers knew the right answer. It's kind of Bayesian. Hmm? It's kind of Bayesian. It, Bayesian? Bayesian. Uh, not really. It's just that the pre-conscious brain evaluates the world much more accurately than the conscious. Uh, here's the best explanation for what consciousness is. It's an error-correcting space. It doesn't actually control most behavior, including what we say and what we do. That's already calculated and played out. It's for, if we're anxious, the world is not familiar, we have to construct the world and try to understand it, to model it, and that's what's conscious. So the need for accuracy is irrelevant. We don't need an accurate representation, we need a rough representation to not act, but to think about what it might be, and then to act on whatever those we think is the most possible. So that's something to choose. Well, I'm going to say the final word. Uh, the first one. It's off. Well, oh, okay. so the final say. Uh, thanks to the three of you uh, for this very, very uh, interesting talks and for the very fruitful discussions that we had today. And we'll be waiting for the new book from Feldman, uh, Levi, and Marcus to appear in the libraries. We'll be waiting for this one. You can be sure of that. And. Well, really, thanks, thanks for that. It's been a great thank impression. You. Thanks to the audience also. And so the good news is that all of us can go back to, you can switch system two and go back to what you call zombie mode. So we can become zombies, but I hope the, the students that you will see tomorrow morning will have revert and switch back to zombie to mode two and will have quit the zombie mode by tomorrow morning. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you all very much.